Quinch used to play loads of games here at Twickenham. A bit more wood around in those days, the old towering green wooden stands. Much more space age in 2017. Uh, but once again, they've crossed the busy A316 to set us up for another big game. I was lucky enough to play pretty well in big game 10 uh, and had a decent run in my first big game, big game six against Exeter as well. So my memories of big game are massive. And the, the walk across, the crowd, the whole aura, atmosphere about it is absolutely brilliant and fantastic. And to, to captain the team, like I did in big game 10, was one of the proudest moments I've ever had on a rugby pitch. A big game for both. You don't really realise how big a game it is until you're in it. So my first year was big game five, I think it was, and I was on the periphery of the squad, not really involved, um, and obviously knew how much it meant to the players. But you know, yeah, it was it was massive crowd and stuff. But you're thinking, okay, in the day it's another Premiership game. But then as soon as you become part of it as a player, it starts in about October because Trish comes around and goes, right, how many tickets do you need? Um, and my family from Bristol. They, you know, they basically ended up being about 24, 25 tickets, um, which is fantastic. It's unbelievable, but obviously they've got to pay for them. So I, I always remind them of this. I'm, I think I'm owed a little bit of cash deal at some point. Um, but it starts then, and it's, at, it's the first fixture you look at from the fixture list. Who have we got a big game? As a player, it's, it's spine tingling. It's, it doesn't matter how many times you do it, because you walk out, even with your headphones in or whatever it is, or your small conversations you're having with people. The funny, all the funny thing is, is no one wants to go first. So guys are, you know, jockeying for position. But as captain, I kind of had to go first. So I think it was me and Luke Wallace at the time, we were walking across and, um, yeah, you just have to just eat it all up. And there's no better word to, you know, to describe it, just to say, look, this is what it's all about. And Big Game 10 was one of the big, like the almost sellout, I think it was, um, and so we were lined the whole way. And when you got to Twickenham, it was crazy because there were so many fans. I think we might have even been a bit late. So there's even more fans. And they all want to, you know, wish you well, good luck. There's my family there as well. My nieces were there. They were saying good luck and waving at me. Um, I'm trying to act cool with my headphones in, um, but never, never somehow managed to pull it off quite as well as some of the other guys. Um, and I suppose then you, you've got a job to do and you enjoy that walk across. But as soon as your bag's down, your boots are out, you're like, okay, what are we doing? What, you know, what's the plan of action you know, from the warm-up, etc. Our rugby players, they're, they're, they'll all lie to you, but they love it. They love any new bit of kit, new bit of stash. They absolutely love it. And, and to see the design that the teams that we've come up with in the past, I think Adidas has done a fantastic job. And you walk into the changing room, it's not quite uh, what you expect to see because you're not at the stoop. It's not the traditional Harlequins colours. You are in the England changing room and the home changing room and you are wearing a different kit and it's very special. Um, you don't get to keep it, mind, obviously, but um, I blame the team manager for that. Um, but you get a replica somewhere down the line. And once more, Sinclair. Oh, Ward, and he's got some toe. Oh, he's got the Alexander. A hooker has sidestepped a fullback and scored a glory. Try at the build up play to the try was actually probably our best bit of play the whole game. We actually went through about six or seven phases, which they never sort of show when they show the try. Um, but it was really good play. We've been working on our attack and shape all week, and it just so happened it comes together. Carl Sinclair um, was involved three or four times in, in the move. This is it from Carl Sinclair. You can see the guy separated, comes to the line, Dave Ward runs off him, a really good line. There's one through getting through the hole, but then to rush the 15. Mallinder in that fashion, not only a really good touch from Carl Sinclair, a lovely finish from Dave Ward. When you get Sink on form, which most of the time is one of the best players in the world, there's no doubt about it. And again, for, for a player like me, to run off guys like Sink, guys like Marla, with the size that they are, the, the, the ability they've got with ball in hand, there's going to be space somewhere because the defenders can't defend both two defenders on Sink and the space either side, or usually guys like Nick Easter would take that one-on-one -on -one collision and then they'd get the offload away. Um, so for me to hang around those sort of guys and look at the space, 
um, and to build up relationships. And that's what me and Carl had a great relationship while we were playing together. He knew where I was going to run. Um, and we, we talked about it on the field. And as the ball spread across to the right, I think Marla takes it in from the left off Danny. And we said, and, cut, and I think knew, I said, bounce out. I think it was, and pop. And he knew that the two defenders were going to try and attack him. And the space was just going to be just on the outside. Um, and what is my old coach has always used to say to me, the best place to attack is where the defenders just left because they can't defend it. So as Hartley steps in, I think it was, the space was just behind him. I ran through. And then I just got a bit lucky with Malander in the end because people started, I think people give me a bit of credit for sort of a side step or a swerve. I kind of just ran the opposite of the direction of where he's just come from. I just wanted to make the tackle harder for him. So then my arms were free to get the offload for the next guy pushing through, usually Danny Kerr. Um, as it happens, he kind of slipped. And I was like, okay, I'm going to have to run it all the way to the try line now, which luckily for me, again, was only about eight or nine metres. Um, but yeah, it was one of those, everything just happened pretty quickly. Um, and it's great, obviously, and the team can celebrate it. But then it's kind of like, right, okay, next job. That's seven points. No point going to do seven points if you could concede seven points straight away. So, And as a captain, I kind of had to rein everyone in, calm everyone down. Whilst inside, I'm going nuts. Um, yeah. I'm like, oh my God, I've just scored the best try of my career. But I'm like, right, lads, right, next job, what are we going to do? And Amala's just looking at me and going, shut up, mate, that was unbelievable. Like, no, he's like, okay. <laughs> Smith, oh, he sensed some room. And he's gathered the ball really nicely. Oh, and little Marlo to Visser. Maland is there. And here goes Roberts, bursting through. Check, they have a second score. Charlie oh, Walker. Yeah, just have a little check. And the are ripping it up at Marcus at 10, still young 10. I think that was his, maybe his second season, maybe even his first season, actually. Um, and get, him, get Marcus on the front foot. Once you get Marcus on the front foot, there's no better attacking fly-off in England. Um, maybe Danny Cipriani could chuck his hat into the ring. Um, but when Marcus was on the front foot, he was fantastic, and he still is, obviously. Um, and then you, you create space in behind. And that's what he did for the second try. Little chip in behind. We kept the ball alive like Harlequins of old almost. Uh, fantastic interplay. People don't realise Chris Robshaw making that pass. If, he, if Robshaw doesn't make that pass, we don't score because Danny's gone into the breakdown. And these are the sort of stuff that Chris never gets enough credit for because he was one of the best decision makers in rugby I've ever played with. What I mean by that, he just constantly made the right decision. Whether to carry, whether to ruck, whether to offload, whether to pass whether to tackle whatever it was and I think you know those little things that people don't recognize is why he is and still you know probably one of the best players to ever play for Harlequins uh, and a fantastic player so he makes the pass uh, Jamie goes through and then Charlie Walker he just scores tries as Connor used to tell me all the time so he yeah. picks up his try uh, and then we're off to the races and then like you say rugby's a massive momentum thing you know once we get going and we start to attack and we start to go forward. Um, the third try was off a turnover. Marcus again on the front foot, pass out to Visser. Um, and then the uh, fourth one was classic Danny Kerr. You know, sees a, sees a tight five, a guard and a uh, bodyguard. And said, right, there's a big hole between them. I'm going to go on, uh, there between the sticks. Um, so, yeah, the first half was kind of like dream world, really. Because we were so far up and we were playing so well, you can't keep that relentless pressure up. There's, at some point, the Saints are going to get their foothold in the game. At some point, Saints are going to go, enough is enough. They started to build pressure. I think Jack went to the sim bin. Um, and they, they got a couple of tries. One was probably my fault, actually, when Nick Groom sort of dummied and went as I was stepping around. It was a good play from him and another from a mall. You know, a couple of scores up. And, and I suppose, again, that's where we went, got together as a team. We took that 10-minute period of when uh, Jack was in the bin and said, right, let's control this element of it. When we get back to the full complement 15, let's get back to what we're doing in the first half. Forwards are carrying, set-piece functioning, Marcus on the front foot. And when we did those, I think we went on to score another three tries after that. Next Quinn score will be their biggest ever against Northampton. And John Okito is off in search of... The significant score, and they've got it anyway. And it's Matt Luamanu. 
It is now officially a record dropping for Northampton at the hands of the Londoners. We definitely wanted to do it for John at the time. I mean, our, our results weren't going as well as we wanted to, and we knew that, you know, everyone looked at that game as a bit of a kickstart to our season, which it should have been. Um, and, yeah, to captain that side to that performance that we knew we were capable of and we didn't show enough that year was, uh, was something that, as I said, I look back on massively fondly and, you know, I've, I think I've said it before, but I've, I've watched the game a few times.